Well, happy Father's Day to everyone. Um, just so appreciate everything you do as a father. And, uh, you know, pretty much we are, what we do as a father is we just say, we ask our wives, okay, what do we need to do? And they tell us. So thank you for obeying your wives and what they tell you to do. So, <laughs> no, seriously, though, just thank you for all the sacrifice you make as a father. So important in this day and age that we, that we really have those fathers in the house that will, that will raise up godly men and women. Amen. Amen. So if you have your Bibles, let's go ahead and turn to Isaiah chapter 57, verse 13. The Lord just laid this message on my heart to share. But I, I want to talk today about Isaiah 57, verse 13, and uh, just to unpack that and explain what I believe the Lord is wanting to stir up within us today and stir up within us going forward. And so, Lord, I just thank you for your power and your peace and your presence, Lord, that your anointing would flow in this message, that we would, we would really sense your heart today, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. So Isaiah chapter 57, verse 13. Now, I'm going to talk about the, the last part of this uh, verse, not the first part. The Lord, or Isaiah, gives a promise to us, and he says, but he who takes refuge in me... Or you could say, he who trusts in me, he who runs to me for protection, he who puts their trust in the Lord, notice what he says, they will inherit the land, but the actual better translation would be the earth. I believe the Lord in the Sermon on the Mount quoted Isaiah 57, 13, when he said, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Because meekness is a disposition of the heart that comes out of trusting God. Meekness is when you, when you have your trust in the Lord what, and, and, and you trust God to be your provider and your healer and your breakthrough. And he, you trust the Lord to be your salvation and your deliverance and all those things he is. When you trust in the Lord and you put your trust in the Lord... And you say, I am not going to try to do this myself, but I'm going to trust in him that what forms in your heart is meekness because you begin to say, I am trusting in him. I'm not going to resist what he's doing in my life. And that's why I think Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 5 said, blessed are the meek, blessed are those who trust in the Lord and don't fight against his plan. Blessed are those because they will inherit the earth and they will possess my holy mountain. Now, what does that mean? What is the Lord speaking and what does it mean to inherit the earth and what does it mean to possess my holy mountain? That's really what I want to talk about today is what does it mean for the bride of Jesus Christ to inherit the earth and to possess the holy mountain of God. That's the theme of what we're talking about. So where I want to go in this message, i got five things I want to do in this message. Is I, I First of all, I want to explain what Isaiah was talking about. What does that mean in, in, in our lives? Does it mean we're going to actually possess a mountain? Does it mean we're going to inherit the earth like right now? I don't believe the answer, that's the answer is yes. I believe he's talking about the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ, which is the theme of Isaiah. It's the major theme of the book of Isaiah is the thousand-year messianic kingdom of Jesus Christ. Uh, Revelation chapter 20 talks about it. When he comes to the earth and he reigns for a thousand years, I believe those thousand years are literal. I see no reason whatsoever to spiritualize that text. I believe it's a literal 1,000-year reign of Jesus Christ on the earth. So I'm going to explain how those two promises relate to the millennial kingdom and I, I hopefully want to paint a, or I'm going to try my best to paint a verbal picture of the future of when Jesus Christ comes to the earth. Because what I've found, and he reigns on the earth, what I've found is if we can see the picture of this, if we can get a vision of this, it will change the way we live. Proverbs talked about that, that without vision, when you don't have Vision And the, really the, the vision is not just I got a vision to run an organization or I got a vision to start a business and all that's good. But Proverbs is really talking about a vision that comes out of revelation. When you don't have a vision, what happens is you live an unrestrained life. But what happens is when you have a vision, 
or a mission, but when you see the prophetic future very clear, what happens is it creates in you discipline and restraint so that you can live in a way that pleases God. And so I want to do my best to paint a verbal picture of what this millennial kingdom is going to be like because there are, I don't know how many verses, it seems like there are hundreds of verses that go into incredible amounts of detail that talk about the millennial kingdom, the thousand-year reign of Christ. I want to paint that picture because what I want to do in painting that picture is I want to establish it within you a vision to show you the destiny that God has for you and the destiny that God has for me is incredible beyond words. And when you see that vision, it will motivate you to live radically different than if you don't see it. That's my goal. So that's where we're going here in this message. Amen. So let's talk about the millennial kingdom for a second. A lot of people, when you talk about the millennial kingdom, when I mean the millennial kingdom, I mean when Jesus Christ comes to the earth, when Jesus Christ comes to the earth and he reigns from Jerusalem for 1,000 years, that's what I'm talking about. There will be a literal reign of Jesus Christ on the earth for 1,000 years. Sometimes people look at this or think about this and they go, well, this isn't really practical. And they, you know, I, I've heard this complaint. It's like, I'm not really worried about that. I don't really care what it talks about or means. I just want something practical like, how can I take care of my family? How can I pay the bills? How can I do better at my job or whatever? How can I be a good Christian? And what I found, and I understand that I've had conversations with people that have expressed that kind of an attitude, but what I found is when I really get a vision of the prophetic future, it changes me in a very practical way down to what I do with my time, my money, and my energy. So this is very, very practical, okay? This is very practical, and it changes the way you live. This is what I found, is how you live today determines how you will live forever. I'm not talking about where you will live, heaven or hell. I'm talking about how you will live. It's very different. Not your destination, your destiny. I just want to drill this into us again. How you live today determines how you will live forever. Not everyone who is born again, justified, and heaven-bound is going to have the same experience in heaven. How you live today determines how you will live forever. Your, your eternal destiny is determined by how you live during this short time you have on earth. How critical it is that we live in a radical pursuit of God, wholehearted after him. There was, a, you may have heard of this phrase by Stephen Covey. He's passed away and I think many years ago, but he wrote a book about this, the habits of highly effective people. And, and he, he made a quote that I love and he said, Begin with the end in mind. I love that. Now, that was, of course, not talking about the millennial kingdom, but it was talking about what you do in your job or your business or your, you know, you're creating a project or a task or your day. Begin with the end in mind. What is it you want to accomplish? What is it you want to do? Get a very clear blueprint of what you're trying to do. You know, see it, see that blueprint, and then work your way back to where you are now and say, okay, what do I need to do to get there? That preferred future, that vision that you want to be accomplished in your life. And that same principle is a very important principle. I would encourage you to, to just remember that principle. Begin with the end in mind as a parent, as a as a business person, as a minister, whatever it is you're going through, whatever it is God's called you to do, begin with the end in mind. What, what is it God wants you to do? Now, I want to apply that principle today to the bride of Christ in the millennial kingdom because if you begin with that end in mind and you work your way back down to where you are now, it will lay out a pathway for how you live in such a way to get there. So like Isaiah said, you inherit the earth and you possess God's holy mountain. Amen. You with me here? So I want to lay out here real quick a vision of the Lord's millennial reign. I just wanted you to see this. And I'm going to go through a ton of scriptures. They're all in the notes. 
But I'm going to go through it pretty quick because I just want to paint a picture. It's not really a teaching, but I just want to just paint a picture for you in your heart. Just think of me kind of like Bob Ross and you're the canvas. I don't have, quite have the Bob Ross hair or I don't have the soft voice. You might go to sleep if I did that. But I just want to paint onto your heart a picture of what this time will be like, starting with the resurrection of the dead. See, when Jesus Christ comes back, the scripture's talking about in Revelation chapter 20, verse 4, that those that John saw, he saw thrones and they sat on them. And he saw those who had lost their heads and, they, and he saw those who did not take the image of the beast or worship him. And they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. In other words, when the Lord returns at his second coming will be what scripture calls the first resurrection. That's the first resurrection. Those who, those who are Christ, those who've made themselves ready, will be experienced that first resurrection. And those who are alive on the earth, when, that, when he comes back, those who are alive, they'll be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, and they will also experience and get that resurrection glorified body. All right? So, so when the Lord comes back, and everyone is, every one of his peop the people that are with him all those of his people on the earth with him will have resurrected, glorified bodies. Does that make sense? We are going to enter the millennial kingdom. Every one of the Lord's people who are saved, who are with him, okay, who are with him, who return with him, the called, chosen, and faithful, those who have made themselves ready, and those on the earth will have resurrected, glorified bodies. Okay, got that? Now comes the judgment of the nations. Matthew chapter 25. I'm not going to read the whole, I'm not going to read it. But Matthew chapter 25, the, the parable of the sheep and the goats. Jesus told a parable. He says, when the Son of Man comes on him, he sits on his glorious throne. And we're going to get into this in a minute. But he was talking about the time when the Lord comes back. He sits on his glorious throne on Mount Zion in Jerusalem. On this, and I'll, I'll explain this, on this temple mount complex the nations are going to be gathered to him. Now, the nations, I think it means two categories of people. Number one, it means the leaders of nations. And number two, it means citizens of the nations. Now, these who are coming to the judgment of the nations are not saved. Okay? They're coming to this. If they were saved, they would already had resurrected bodies. This is not a determination, so to speak, of... Let me say it this way. This is, if you have resurrected bodies and you're his, you're already with the Lord. These are, uns I believe these are unsaved Gentiles who are going to be evaluated when the Lord comes back in Jerusalem and he's going to, he's going to evaluate the leaders. Joel chapter 3 talks about this. Did you, to the leaders, did you divide the land of Israel? Did you send the Jewish people into captivity? And I, and I don't, even though Joel 3, 1 through 2 doesn't talk about this, did you persecute the church during that, that seven-year period or during that last three-and-a-half-year period? How did you deal, how, as leaders, how did you deal with Israel? How did you deal with the church? How did you deal with the Jewish people? Now, the citizens who are not leaders are going to be evaluated on how they dealt, on how they responded to the leaders who decided to persecute Israel, divide Israel, persecute the church. The, the citizens are going to be judged, and they're going to be judged on the basis of when you saw them in prison, when you saw them homeless, when you saw them naked, when you saw them without clothing, how did you respond? Does this make sense, what I'm saying? Uh, okay. Those, okay, those who responded by visiting the Lord's people in prison, those who responded by clothing the homeless, those who responded by giving them food and drink during the great tribulation, those ones the Lord's going to say to them, I believe the Lord's going to say to them, I am going to spare your life. Those who did not respond in that way, the Lord's going to say, you are sentenced to death. Okay, that makes sense. Matthew, I'm speaking Matthew 25. Those that that are those who have their lives spared will then experience salvation. The way they responded to Jews and Christians during the tribulation are not going to be the basis of their salvation because that would be salvation by works. 
This is not salvation by works. This is salvation by grace through faith. In other words, the Lord says, because you stood with my people during their, their greatest hour of testing, I'm going to spare your life. And subsequently what happens is they put their faith in Jesus Christ. They are saved, and then the Lord says they inherit the kingdom. Now, keep in mind, those, who are, those people who are saved don't have resurrected bodies. Those are the ones who are going to repopulate the earth during the millennial kingdom without resurrected bodies. Does that make sense? I'm trying to just paint a picture here. You're kind of looking at me like, what on earth are you talking about? Anyway, a lot of detail. That is a very complex uh, chapter, but I, I just want to, or, or parable, I just want to just see the picture is, is this, these, these nations without resurrected bodies are going to be the one who repopulate the earth in the millennial kingdom. They're the ones that, the, that Jesus and the church are going to have authority over in the nations. Okay. So more details are in the notes. But let's just say for the sake of this, this example, it's 500,000 or I mean 500 million people are, are, are survive the great tribulation and survive the judgment. They're going to repopulate the earth. Now, let's, let's show the slide here. Jesus' government, the way Jesus' government is, is set up, is going to be set up here in the millennial kingdom, is it talks about that, that Zechariah chapter 14, verse 9 says that in that day, he is going to be king over all the earth. I love that. We were singing about during worship. Jesus Christ is coming back as King of kings and Lord of lords. Daniel described it. He is coming back and he is going to crush the kingdoms of man. And his kingdom is going to be set up and his kingdom has no end. Of the increase of his government, there will be no end. So you have Jesus here at the very top, the King of kings and Lord of lords. You've got a Gentile branch and you've got a Jewish branch. Let's talk about the Jewish branch just real quick. You've got the 12 apostles, and the 12 apostles are going to be given thrones, and they are going to judge the 12 tribes of Israel in the millennial kingdom. Jesus talked about that in Matthew chapter 19. Underneath the apostles are going to be counselors and judges. They're going to have authority over Israel, and Israel's going to have uh, jurisdiction over the Gentile nations because the Gentile nations are going to be coming to Jerusalem because Jesus is there. In the Gentile branch, you have the overcomers, okay? This is where you and I come into play. If we respond to what Jesus said in Revelation chapter 2, if you overcome the influence of Jezebel, I will give you a rod of iron by which you will rule the nations. He's talking about ruling the nations when he comes back. That is the invitation the Lord has given to me, and that is the invitation he's given to you. You are going to rule nations, you, you've seen, you remember the parable of the minas when the Lord uh, gave out minas and he said, the way you take the mina and the way you steward the resources that I have given you will determine whether or not you have authority over cities. If you're faithful as a steward, you'll have authority over five cities. You'll have authority over two cities. You'll have authority over ten cities. Depending on your faithfulness with the time, the treasures, and the talent God's given you. That's why it's very important that we multiply the talents God's given us. That, because that's determining whether or not we rule and reign with him. Amen. How you live today determines how you'll live forever. And then, and then again, Jesus said to the lukewarm church, he said, if you overcome lukewarmness, if you overcome apathy, you will sit down with me on my throne. What a glorious promise that we are given a throne and we are given the rod of iron to rule cities and nations with. So if we overcome, we are those overcomers there in this chart. We're going to rule over kings and governors and mayors and every, every other facet of government you can think of, and they're going to rule over the natural kings. They're going to rule, rule over the Gentile nations. Okay, you with me? Okay, here's where it gets very, very exciting to me. This is what really gets me stirred up. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 2 real quick. Isaiah chapter 2 is talking exactly about this time period. Isaiah chapter 2, verse, or I turn to Jeremiah. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2. It 
Now, it will come about, let me start with verse 1. The word which Isaiah, the son of Amoz, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Okay, he's not talking about the church. I've heard many charismatic preachers over the, over the you know, however long I've been saved, say that Isaiah chapter 2 is talking about the church is going to be raised up and the nations are going to stream to it. He's not talking about the church. He's talking about Judah and Jerusalem. Now, it will come about that in the last days, this, I love this phrase, the mountain of the house of the Lord. There is going to be a mountain in Jerusalem, and that mountain, on top of that mountain, is going to reside the house of the Lord. I'm going to explain that in a minute. It will be established as the chief of the mountains. The ESV translation says it will be the highest of the mountains. That is, that is awesome. I mean, it is going to be the highest of the mountains. Whether, that's, whether the ESV is correct or whether the NASB is correct, I'm not sure. But it's going to be a massive, massive mountain. It's going to be raised above the hills, and all the nations are going to stream to it. Just get the picture of those that survive the judgment of the nations. They're going to stream to that house. And I love the picture is, is streams normally flow downhill, but they're going to be streaming uphill in Zion, in Jerusalem, in the millennial kingdom, streaming to the house of the Lord. And they're going to be saying, they're going to be saying, let's go to the Taylor Swift concert, or let's go to the Georgia game, or let's go to this event. No, they're not going to be saying that. They're going to be saying, come. Let's go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his, concerning his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For the law will go forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he will judge between the nations and render decisions for many people. And they will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, and never again will they learn war. What a glorious picture. The house of the Lord. That's why I want to just unpack to you in a minute. When you can see the picture of what takes place, of these incredible changes that are going to take place in the earth. Second Peter talks about the present heaven and the present earth are going to be renovated by fire. They're going to be purified by fire. They're not going to be destroyed at that time, like they're going to go away. They're going to be renovated by fire. And after being renovated by fire, there's going to be these changes, these topological changes. It's even uh, Zechariah mentions it, that around the city of Jerusalem is going to become a plain, and the city of Jerusalem is going to be raised up. And I, Isaiah said it's going to be the highest of the mountains. Ezekiel and Ezekiel 20 and Ezekiel chapter 40 talk about this mountain he said, this mountain is going to be, I was taken to this mountain and it was very high. So, you know, let's just say, let's just say that, that things change a little bit, but let's say that this mountain is like Mount Kilimanjaro in Tanzania, the highest mountain in Africa. Show that slide there. I just want you to see, okay, we're talking about a, a massive mountain. We don't know for sure exactly how big it is, but in the city of Jerusalem, this mountain like this is going to be raised up. And on this mountain is going to be a plateau where the house of the Lord resides. And your house, I believe, if you're the, the bride made ready. I remember the first time we went to Jerusalem, we went to Israel in 2002, and I had read about all this in the, in the prophets, and I was like, oh man, I'm so excited, I'm so excited. We're going to go to Israel, we're going to see that place where the Lord's going to reign from. And I looked at it, and I was like, I was, you know, sorry, but I was a little bit disappointed. I was like, I mean, it's, it's cool, but it's not what I was expecting. And the reason is because it's not what it's going to be. <laughs> what you see right now is not what it's going to be. It's going to experience dramatic changes. God is going to create a mountain in this Jerusalem area that's going to be raised up about, let's just, just say for this example, 20,000 feet like Mount Kilimanjaro. And on the top of that mountain is going to be this plateau. And that pla on that plateau is going to be the house of the Lord. See, Daniel described it this way. He said, when he was talking about in Daniel chapter 2, he said, he saw this statue, and he saw this stone that was cut without human hands, 
and, this, and that's describing Jesus Christ. That statue came, or that, that stone came, and it struck the statue on its feet and crushed it and scattered it to the wind. And that stone that struck the statue, uh, Daniel said, that stone became a great mountain. I love it. Again, the high mountain, the great mountain, the chief of the mountains. That's your destiny. That is the mountain you're called to possess from Isaiah 57, 13. That means you're called to have ownership and possession to dwell on that mountain for the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ as the bride. This making sense? The more you can see the bride of Christ in the millennial kingdom, I, I, just, I just read this stuff and I just get so pumped up, so excited. This is an incredible destiny God has for us. Now, the prophets would call this mountain, especially Isaiah, called this mountain Mount Zion. I've, I've seen Mount Zion in Jerusalem right now. It's not very impressive. That mountain is going to be very impressive. All the nations are going to stream to it. Now, on top of that mountain, this is in Ezekiel 40 through 48, is going to be a temple mount complex. It's not going to be the temple mount that we presently see in Jerusalem. That's going to be destroyed. There's going to be a temple mount complex. Ezekiel chapter 40 through 48 describes it in great detail. Um, I, I, it, now, in, in Ezekiel chapter 45, I love, this is beautiful. It's talking about, in Ezekiel 48 talks about the 12 tribes of Israel getting different portions of the land. But Ezekiel 45 talks about the Lord's portion in the land. That's beautiful. The Lord's portion in the land is the top. The summit of that mountain is the Lord's portion. Now, on top of that, I just want to show you this. Uh, show the next slide, the, the temple. The, the temple. I got this here from Arnold Fruchtenbaum. I, I like to say his name, Fruchtenbaum. But just an excellent book in the, in the footsteps of the Messiah. He, he took Ezekiel 40 through 48 and mapped it out. I'm just going to just go over this real quick. It's in your notes. But here's what I want you to grasp. It's 50 miles wide and 50 miles long on the top of that plateau. Okay, for us who live in Atlanta, that's driving from Cartersville to Atlanta. Driving from Cartersville to Atlanta the other way. Driving from Cartersville to Atlanta the other way and then back. It's massive. It's 2,500 square miles. It is a massive complex. And the temple, you can see where the temple is. It's a one mile by one mile temple complex. And there's, there's two portions of this temple. There's a 20 mile area, 20 mile by 50 mile area for the sons of Zadok. There's another 20 mile by 50 mile area for the sons of Lephi. And the Lord was saying the sons of Zadok, because they were faithful to the Lord when Israel went astray, they are going to minister to the Lord in his temple. But the sons of Levi who went astray are not. And I, I believe that's going to be fulfilled literally, but I also believe it has incredible application because the bride of Christ, type and shadow, is meant to be like the sons of Zadok. Those who overcome will have a ministry to the Lord. Forever, for, forever and ever, but I'm talking about for a thousand years, your ministry is going to be to the Lord on this mountain. And, you're going to, and it, the, the beauty and the glory of God is going to just fill the entire earth. That's your destiny as the bride of Christ, to behold the Lord on this mountain. Now, if you notice down at the bottom here, there's a 10-mile by 10-mile city. That's the city of Jerusalem. And Ezekiel 48, I forget the exact verse, Ezekiel 48, it's the last verse in Ezekiel 48, the Lord changes the name of the city, or names Jerusalem and says, the name of that city is the Lord is there. The Lord is there. What an incredible, beautiful picture. This will be the fourth temple in Jerusalem, his, Jerusalem's history. They had the Solomon's temple, then Zerubbabel's temple, which Herod took to a new level when Jesus walked the earth. The third temple, which is going to be the temple that the Antichrist is enthroned in. 
But this will be the fourth temple that Jesus himself will build. This is Mount Zion. Now, it talks about in Isaiah, it talks about the tabernacle of David is going to be restored. On Mount Zion, the tabernacle of David is going to be restored. In other words, the glory of God is going to fill this mountain and there will be continuous nonstop worship that's to the Lord. And you as the bride of Christ are called to be that priestly bride who ministers to the Lord in this temple, in this house. Now the glory of God, here's where, here's where this, is, this is what's so incredible. The glory of God, Ezekiel described it, it comes in from the east the whole earth shines with his glory, and if he fills the house of God with his glory, and they shut the gate because the glory will never depart from that house again. And that glory will be the person of Jesus Christ himself. He's coming back in power and in great glory. He's coming back in power and in great glory. He's going to fill this house. And Isaiah, oh man, this is incredible. You've got to memorize this verse. Isaiah chapter 24 Verse 23, Isaiah, I'm just going to quote it. Isaiah said that in that day, the sun is going to be abashed. The moon is going to be ashamed. For the Lord will, is going to rule. The Lord is going to rule in his glory. He, he's going to, sorry, I'm misquoting. He's going to reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem. And his glory is going to be before his elders. In other words, Isaiah is telling us, the glory of Jesus Christ is going to be so intense in that day that the sun is going to be embarrassed. The moon is going to be ashamed. They're going to be so embarrassed because the Lord's glory is so intense on this mountain. Memorize that verse. Habakkuk 2.14 says that in that day, the earth is going to be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God like the waters cover the sea. Everyone in the nations are going to be talking about, hey, have you guys heard of Jesus Christ and his glory on Mount Zion? I haven't seen it yet, but I heard it's so intense. It's seven times brighter than the sun. Yet we need to go up to the house of the Lord and experience that. We need to go up to the house of the Lord and see what it's all about. But you as the bride will be dwelling there as his priestly bride ministering to him on that temple mount in the, in the, on Mount Zion. Now let's talk about the bride on Mount Zion. Isaiah chapter 4 verse 5. I, I want you to just encourage you to read these scriptures. If you've never read these scriptures in this light that I'm bringing to you today, I want to encourage you to read these scriptures in this light because it changes the way you see it. This is after the, the great tribulation when Jesus has come back. And it says, The Lord will create over the whole area of Mount Zion and over her assemblies a cloud by day, even smoke. Just get the idea that there, there's a cloud by day on top of this 2,500 square mile area on Mount Zion. There's this cloud of, of smoke. And at night there's a brightness of a flaming fire. For over all of the glory will be a canopy. That's the hupa. I'm sure I'm not saying it in Hebrew correctly, but the hupa. Sorry, spit a loogie and say it. A hupa. I'm just going to say it like we say it in the South. Hupa. That's the wedding canopy. That's where the marriage in a Jewish wedding system, Dad's talked about this, I've talked about this. That's where the marriage in the wedding, Jewish wedding system took place, under the hupa. The marriage of Jesus Christ to his bride, to you and to me, will take place on that mountain, under the hoopah. There will be such a glory, not just the glory of Jesus Christ, but it will be the glory of Jesus Christ, but also the radiance of his bride, who at that time has a resurrected, glorified body, who is shining like the sun in his strength. Quoting Matthew 13. So we see under this hoopah is incredible, radiant glory where the bride and the bridegroom are joined together as husband and wife forever. How beautiful. I've got to be part of that. 
Now, following that is the wedding ceremony. The wedding ceremony in Jewish customs, Jewish wedding systems, was not like we have today where you just go for a couple hours and, you know, afterwards you go home. This was like a seven-day long festival. And, you know, who knows exactly how long this wedding feast is going to last on Mount Zion. But I, I think it's going to last a, I don't think it's just going to be like a one-hour thing. It's going to be extended period of time. Look at what it, let's turn to um, Isaiah chapter 25, verse 6. So just painting the picture so, so you can see this, so that you'll be like, you'll be ruined, I'm ruined by this. So you'll be ruined by this <clears throat> to say, God, I've got to, be the, I've got to be made ready. Okay, so the Lord of hosts will prepare a lavish banquet for all the people on this mountain. Where is it? On this mountain. I don't believe the marriage supper of the Lamb is going to be in heaven. I believe the marriage supper of the Lamb is going to be on the earth during the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. The Lord of hosts is going to prepare a banquet on this mountain, a banquet of aged wine, choice pieces with marrow, refined aged wine. And on this mountain, he will swallow up the covering, which is over all the people, the veil which is stretched out over the nations. In other words, there's a veil right now that is hindering people from seeing God. In that day, that veil is going to be removed. Even the veil of the bride, when, she, when that veil is removed, it will foreshadow the veil that's un, un, removed in that day. And the nation, and the bride beholds the king in his beauty. What David cried out for in Psalm 27, I, one thing I've asked from the Lord that I will seek, that I may be, dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life and behold the beauty of the Lord and meditate in his house. That will be your reality for a thousand years and then into the eternal ages. As the bride of Jesus Christ, the priestly bride who ministers to him, your inheritance is the king in his beauty. You will forever behold the king in his beauty. You will be stunned. You will be amazed as his glory shines and radiates and you are face to face with him. Made ready as the bride. Wow, I'm glad you're excited. Go down a couple verses, and it says, It will be said in that day, Behold, this is our God, for whom we have waited, that he might save us. This is the Lord from whom we have waited. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. That's a direct quote of Revelation 19.7. Let us rejoice and be glad. That came from Isaiah chapter 25. Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Man, this is going to be incredible. And we see the Lord and we say, that's the, that is the one we've been waiting for. That's the one we've been preparing for. That's him. He's beautiful. He's glorious. He's stunning. In that day, the branch of the Lord will be beautiful. And your eyes will see the king in his beauty. And you will be like David, worshiping before the throne in awestruck beauty and wonder. On this mountain... Jesus is going to be restored in the tabernacle of David where the priestly bride uh, uh, gives praise and worship to the Lord with music I, I don't think we can even comprehend. On this mountain, the bride will behold and experience the glory of Jesus Christ and minister to him face to face. On this, bride, uh, on this, on this mountain, the bride will see Revelation 3, 12 fulfilled when the Lord said, if you overcome, you will be a pillar in the temple. It's not just talking about the temple in heaven. It's talking about this millennial temple. You'll be a temple, you'll be a pillar in that temple and you will not go out from it anymore. That doesn't mean you never leave that temple because you have authority in cities and nations, but it means you have a permanent dwelling place in that temple. Amen. 
on this mountain, you will inherit the Lord himself. He will be your inheritance. The priest, the Levitical priest in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant, they had no inheritance. The Lord himself was their inheritance. I used to think about that and was like, oh, that sounds boring. That sounds like that would be so boring to like, you know, all these other people get land and money and resources and I get God. I, I started reading this and I'm like, my, my opinion dramatically changed. The Lord in his beauty is your inheritance. You will never, you will have to be like pushed out of Mount Zion to go into your area to rule and reign over the cities and nations. You know, now you think, okay, that sounds really cool. We'll have authority over the nations. And at that time you're like, oh God, do I really have to leave this glory and this beauty of your tabernacle and go out there and rule over those people with a rod of iron? He's like, yeah, you do. You can come back when you're done. But that's what it's going to be like. It's going to be so incredible when you inherit the Lord himself. Yeah, you're going to have crowns. Yeah, you're going to have a rod of iron. Yeah, you're going to have a throne. Yeah, you're going to have all those things. But you're not going to really care that much. I mean, you will care because it's important. But most important, you're going to be casting it down before the beauty of the Lord as the angels before him cry out, holy, holy, holy. That vision that Isaiah had in Isaiah chapter 6, when he was taken into the temple and he saw the Lord high and exalted and the train of his robe filling the temple and the seraphim were crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. That vision gripped Isaiah. And if you read close to the book of Isaiah, that was what he was saying in his book. That vision I saw of the Lord in the temple, and John said it's Jesus Christ. That vision I saw of the beauty and the glory of Jesus Christ that ruined me forever. That is the Lord himself coming back to this mountain and establishing that throne in the city of Jerusalem on the earth. That is your calling. That is your invitation. When Jesus spoke the parable of the wedding feast in Matthew chapter 22, he was talking about that. Not a wedding feast that takes place in heaven, a wedding feast that takes place on the earth. That is your invitation. What an invitation. Your invitation is not just to salvation. Your invitation is not just to be born again, which is glorious, by the way. Born again, regenerated, the Spirit of God dwelling in you, justified, declared righteous. All that's glorious. All that's incredible. But your invitation is so much greater than that. You're called to be his eternal wife. What an invitation. What a glorious, glorious invitation. Let me just say this. That is not an automatic birthright to you. Just because you're born again, justified, and heaven bound, you still must make yourself ready. Revelation 19, 7 through 8, the bride has made herself ready. We've talked about this so many times here. But what I'm trying to do is say, okay, this vision is so glorious that I can't live without seeing this fulfilled in my life. I've got to have this. I don't want to be like Esau, who was given that birthright as a firstborn son. And yet, because he craved Food on the day he was famished. He, he, he gave into the desires of his flesh, and it says he forfeited his birthright by living a carnal lifestyle. I don't want to be, and that's why the writer of Hebrews says, beware that you're not like Esau, that you don't gratify your flesh and forfeit this birthright God is offering to you. Man. That's why Jesus came to the churches in Revelation 2 and 3, and he offered them promises. Most of those promises are related to the millennial kingdom and the eternal ages. 
And he says, if you overcome, if you overcome losing your first love, if you overcome Jezebel, if you overcome false teaching, if you overcome lukewarmness, if you overcome apathy, if you overcome these things, you will inherit those, these incredibly glorious promises of, of eternal intimacy, eternal authority, and eternal glory. But you must make yourself ready. Let's turn to Revelation 19, verse 7. And again, we've talked about this. I feel like we talk about this almost every Sunday. Listen, let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him. What is that? Isaiah 25. Quoting it right there. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Salvation and justification does not make you ready. It's merely the beginning. It's a very important beginning. But we must work out our salvation with fear and trembling. We must work out what God has worked in. We're not getting ready to be saved. And we're not getting ready to stay saved. We're getting ready because salvation is already put into us if we're born again. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And it was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen. Remember that priestly bride I was talking to you about? That fine linen? That is the garment of the priest. It's a priestly bride. The, the, the bride is going to be clothed in fine linen because it's the linen only the priest can come into the Holy of Holies with fine linen. You cannot come into the Holy of Holies with wool. You cannot come into the Holy of Holies with anything that makes you sweat. Nothing of self, nothing of works, nothing that you do for God can come into the Holy of Holies. It's Christ and Christ alone in that Holy of Holies. It is the man, Christ Jesus. It is the one that Isaiah was ruined by. It is that man and his beauty that fills the Holy of Holies and that radiates from the Temple Mount. That is the only man that is in the Holy of Holies. No other name but Jesus Christ. No other. Your, your title will mean nothing in that day. It's him. It's him. It's Christ and it's Christ alone. It's what Christ has done in you. It's what Christ has done through you. Everything else you've done, everything else I've done in fleshly human zeal and ambition that is not of Christ, not born of Christ, not done by Christ, not for Christ, will burn at the judgment seat. Only what is of Christ will survive that fire. God help us. Amen. If that man that glorious, beautiful man, no other name, no other name, no other man. Isaiah, when he had that, that coal of fire touch his lips, and he says, woe is me, I am ruined. Isaiah had been preaching another man. Isaiah had been preaching another man. He had been preaching himself. And he says, woe is me. It was all about me. I'm a man of unclean lips. It's been all about me. But I'm getting this vision of this cry of the King of kings and Lord of lords. I'm ruined by it. I'm ruined by it. And the angel, the seraphim came, touched his lips with a coal of fire and purified his lips so he could be that prophet who spoke of the beauty of the King of kings and Lord of lords. That is the man. That linen is for the, is for the priest, is for the, is for the priestly bride. Nothing that makes you sweat can go in there. Nothing you do for Christ can go in there. It's what we do from Christ. It's what we do out of our union with Christ that will survive those fires. That's our righteous acts. In other words, the Lord says, you did this for me. See, there's coming a day when all of us are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. It's actually called the Bema Seat. And that Bema Seat was taken from the Corinthian Games. When at, at the Corinthian Games, it's kind of like the Olympics. They would gather all of the community in and they would, they would put this massive platform. And the, the person, the people who won the awards in the Olympic Games would be celebrated because of their incredible athletic performance. 
See, your, my evaluation, your evaluation of the judgment seat of Christ, this is sobering, is going to be before heaven to see. It's not going to be off in a closet with you and Jesus and he's evaluating you. It's going to be, the judgment seat is going to be before all of heaven. How did you love me? How did you express your love for me? Or did you do these things for yourself? How did you, Brian, show your love for me in what you did? Did you do these things because you wanted some praise from people? Did you do these things because you wanted people to like you or you wanted to build a name or you wanted to build a ministry or did you do these because you love me? Man, those righteous acts that we do that come out of this love relationship with God, that this first love relationship with Christ, what we do out of this relationship, what we do living from God, that will be the righteous acts we do. That's, those will be the righteous acts that will clothe us on that day. Those will be the wedding garments we wear for all of eternity. How did you love Jesus in your life? How did you express your love for Jesus in your life? What did you do out of that relationship in relationship with him with your life? It's challenging, isn't it? I'm challenged by it. The righteous acts of the saints. That's your wedding dress. Then he said to me, right, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Some people get so tired to make this so confusing, like, well, the only the people talk, talking about that are invited are the Old Testament saints or they're, they're friends of Enoch or they're, you know, just get into some weird theories. This is really, really, really simple. The people who are invited are the people in the previous verse who had righteous acts of the saints. Those are the ones who are invited. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Blessed are those who are invited to be on that mountain, Mount Zion. Man, I want to be there. Those invited to the marriage supper are those who are clothed in fine linen, which are the righteous acts of the saints. See, if we don't have righteous acts, it means no fine linen. And no fine linen means no invitation to this wedding feast on Mount Zion. See, that's why I just want to exhort us. I want to exhort me. I want to just say, God, help us. Is we want to be made ready. We want to be made ready. I believe one of the most important things the Lord is doing in this hour, let's get down to the practical now, let's get down to the everyday life, is he's raising up and preparing a bride for Jesus Christ and the nations. I believe that's at the top of his agenda, is to have a bride made ready. The bride in this nation, is the church in this nation, is not ready in her present condition for this calling. And that's where we come in. That's, where, that's what God has given us as a mission. Our mission, I just want to drive this into us. Our mission as a church is to make the bride of Christ ready in this church, in this city, in this nation, and in the nations. That is our driving mission. That's our driving mission. That's why we exist. That's why we are here. The church in her present condition is not ready for the Lord. You know, I saw a meme floating around social media recently that said if, if Paul was writing today, you could better believe the church in America would be getting a letter. I mean, I know there's a remnant, but the church in America is not a bride made ready for the Lord Jesus himself. We would be getting a letter. I mean, can you imagine what the Lord would say to the, you know, the, you know just like he did in Revelation 2 and 3, to the church in America, right, da, da, da. I mean, what would he say? God, help us. He'd probably say, those seven messages are all for you. 
But I just want to say the church in her present condition is not ready. And thus the mission God has given us to make the bride ready in this church, in this city, in this nation, and in the nations. If you've been on this journey for a while, you know there is getting ready is not an automatic thing. There's a lot the Lord has to do. Okay, I don't want anyone to get under condemnation. That's why we're teaching on uh, indwelling life. It's by his life. It's not by anything you do in and of yourself. It's the life of God in you that makes yourself ready. It's living from him, not living for him. It's living by his life in union with Christ. That is the, the wedding garment you wear. It's not going off and doing things for God to try to make him happy or to make him love you. He already loves you. He's already pleased. Okay, He wants you to live from that place of union with him. And I really appreciated what people were singing today in our worship today that, you know, this, this church is a gift and, you know, built on the fathers that have preceded us, Noel and Dad, and um, all the foundations laid is that there, there, when I look around, there's not a lot of churches and organizations and ministries today who are focused on making the bride ready. I, I don't know of hardly, there's a handful, but not many. That's why I say, you know, I'm saying that not to boast, but to just encourage you. God's got a unique mission on this church, a unique mandate. The Lord's called us in a unique way. It's a high calling. It's a mandate that we must fulfill. You know, all that I was just describing about the millennial kingdom, that's just not going to be automatic. God needs you. God needs me. God needs us as a ministry, as a church, functioning in this mandate so that we would be made ready. And now I want to ask you, what is your personal mission? And do you even have a personal mission? I would probably venture to guess a lot of us haven't really thought about that. Okay, what is my personal life mission? I mean, maybe we've, you know, maybe we've got to vaguely define, okay, you know, you, you agree with what I just said, but have you really said, okay, my life mission is this, this, and this? What is your life mission? Because if you don't have a mission, you will live aimlessly. You will live without direction. You will live without discipline. A mission is so powerful. I just want to encourage you, if you don't have a life mission, let me help you. If you don't have a life mission, I want to encourage you, make your life mission to be made ready as a bride for Jesus Christ. It will take you your entire life. It's going to take me my entire life. But I want to keep that at the forefront of my life. I want this to be my personal mission. The reason I exist, the reason I have breath in my lungs, the reason I still have a heartbeat, the reason of all that is because I live to be made ready as a bride for Jesus Christ. This is why I was created. This is God's eternal purpose. May it become my life purpose. This is God's ultimate intention. May it become my ultimate intention. May it keep me from wandering. May it keep me from going astray by focusing upon this mission. I want to be a bride made ready for Jesus Christ. How about you? Don't just say amen. Just write it out. My life vision, my life mission is to be a bride made ready for Jesus Christ. Amen. Are you still with me? There is incredible power when you have a mission. See, when you have a mission, when you're driven by a mission. By the way, what I'm about to share came from Chat, chat GPT. So it helped me here. So I asked Chat GPT, what does it do when you have a mission? This is what it answered me. Uh, just one little side note here. I asked Chat GPT, I said, I want to uh, I want to preach a message like Mike Bickle and Mike Bickle's style from Matthew chapter 25, 1 through 13. And it was crazy. I mean, it was like, use the very vocabulary he used, beloved, the urgency of the hour, the critical hour. It, it was just really crazy. Then I asked, okay, do the same thing and do it in Joel Osteen style. I was like, I know that some people think that this is like, you know, it's so discouraging that it's, you know, separated between the foolish and the virgin, but I'm here just to encourage you. If you got your word, now God, God's just going to get here. He wants to encourage you, and God's good. And then I said, uh, okay, uh, 
I asked him a question, okay, now do it in Brian Kessler style. Or I said, what does Brian Kessler believe about God's eternal purpose? Like, I'm sorry, there's not enough information out there about Brian Kessler to tell you what he believes about this, this, and that. So anyway, chat GPT. So this is what chat GPT, I, I agree with this. This is really good. Um, chat GPT said, and I agree, that a mission gives you purpose and direction. See, when you have a mission, it, you could apply to anything in your life, but we're applying it right now to the ultimate intention, the ultimate mission, the ultimate purpose is that when you have a mission, when you're driven by this mission, is that it gives you purpose and direction. See, without a mission, we're going to wander aimlessly. We're going to just drift. We're going to wander into complacency, apathy, indifference. We're going to just default to the cravings of the flesh. We're going to come into this place of the culture where we allow the culture to define what we do and the values we set up. But if we have a mission that drives us, that surpasses the culture we live in, it will give us purpose. It will give us direction. It will give us meaning. It will establish our core values and our goals. It will help us to understand this is the direction I need to go. Another thing a mission does is it gives you motivation and inspiration. When you feel like you wake up and your coffee has not yet kicked in and you're waiting for motivation, when you have that clear mission, that clear uh, mission that drives you, it gives you motivation. It inspires you when you feel dead and dry. It gives you that motivation and inspiration to live in a practical way that pleases God. Number three, it gives you a decision-making framework. Now, this could apply to, the, to a church. It could apply to an individual, but it gives you a decision-making framework. In other words, you say, okay, my mission is to be a bride made ready. Okay, these different options I'm faced with right now in making a decision, how do they align with me making myself ready? Well, these don't really align with what I'm trying to do to make myself ready. Therefore, I'm not going to do them. I'm living not just by whatever feels good or sounds good. I'm living by, I'm driven by a mission. I'm driven by this vision. I'm driven by this desire to be made ready. Therefore, my decisions affect the way I make decisions. I just want to encourage you to think this way. This is the way I think. This is the way I think. Now, again... You need someone in your life to say, okay, you need to have fun because if all you did was do this, you'd probably never have fun. That's why you need to have fun. You need to do things that are fun. And, but still, having fun and going on vacation and things like that, that's part of this whole, this whole mission uh, thing. Number four is having a mission gives you alignment and focus. You realize, okay, and it's even, even as it relates to this church, I believe if your life mission is, I want to be a bride made ready, and that's your life mission, and that life mission drives you, and that life mission moves you, and our life mission, or our mission as a church, is to make the bride ready, it creates a sense of unity, and a sense of alignment, and a sense of meaning, and a sense of purpose. This is why we exist. This makes us unique. This is the DNA of the church. This is what drives us and is that we're, we're just going to lay our lives down corporately, collectively, together to make the bride ready in the nations. Number five, accountability and evaluation. When you have a mission, when you're driven by a mission, it gives you accountability to say, okay, you know, I really haven't been living this way I've kind of just drifted. I've kind of just gotten distracted. I've kind of been focused on all these other things. But that mission gives me that accountability like, oh, okay, I have been living in a state of apathy. I've been living in a bit of complacency. I and mean, then it helps you evaluate what you need to do to get back on that mission. And so I just want to, as we bring this message to a close, I just want to end this and say our mission as a church is to make the bride of Christ ready in this church, in this city, in this nation, and in the nations. That is why we exist. And I want to encourage you to make that your life mission. My life mission is I want to be made ready as a bride for Jesus Christ, and I want to make others ready. I don't believe there's a higher purpose in the universe. This is God's ultimate intention. This is the reason why you were created. Find your purpose, your meaning for life in God's eternal purpose. Amen. Lord, we just come to you right now. 
And Lord, we just want to thank you. Thank you for the glorious invitation, Lord. Thank you, Father, for this incredibly glorious invitation. Lord, we don't want to, Lord, we don't want to just tread lightly on this and just assume because we're saved that we're automatically qualified for this. Lord, would you make us ready? Lord, I just, if you want to just, if you want to just make a commitment to say, my life vision is to be a bride made ready, just in your heart right now to the Lord, just express that to him. I say it out loud myself. Lord, I want to establish as my life mission is to be a bride made ready. Lord, to be a bride made ready. Lord, I pray for all the grace of the Holy Spirit that you would give us the inward power of the Holy Spirit, that we might be enabled to be who you've called us to be, to do what you've called us to do, to overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil, so that we might be your inheritance, we, and you might be our inheritance, Lord, that we might be your bride, and we might fulfill your ultimate intention. Lord, I pray any place where we are not in alignment with your ultimate intention, Lord, where we've been distracted by the culture, we've been distracted by things, we've been distracted by work, family, ministry, Lord, even the blessings of God you've given us, Lord, any place where we are not in alignment with that, would you bring us back into alignment? Or would you bring us back into that mission? Would you bring us back into that place? to be made ready. We just thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, just make us ready, Lord. Make us ready. Amen. Amen.